Thank you everybody for coming. It's so wonderful to be doing this lecture in person and to see you all in three dimensions in front of my face. That is especially extended to one person here, um, Professor David Risley, who um, is the reason that I got involved in digital humanities in the first place at NYU Abu Dhabi. We have been working very intensively with many, many students, as you will see on Zoom for the past two years since I left Abu Dhabi, where I was for four years before I joined the history faculty at Stanford. To have David here in three dimensions is like an indescribable experience. And I want to thank um, Sesta especially for creating the conditions to bring him here. Um, also the Stanford Global Studies and the Abbasi Program for Islamic Studies who are all co-sponsoring this talk and, um, and David's visit. Um, it really, you know, David is, it, we're doing this talk, but we're also doing a number of project related activities all week and a number of events at FESTA that you should take a look at in the newsletters um, and join us for as well. But with that, I'll get into the content of the talk. I apologize for my voice. Hopefully, it's going to stay with me um, throughout. So, I'm going to start off by talking about, you know, from a historian's perspective about the Gulf as a contested space and why and how we are approaching um, the Gulf using digital methods. We're, we're going to have a few sections where we talk about the work that we've been doing. The first is going to be on text creation from digitized or digitizable sources. We're also going to talk briefly about questions of space and mapping that we've been quite engaged in over the past four years. Um, we are going to talk about exploring the British archive with a technique called word embeddings that David will explain in some detail. And at the end, we're going to we're going to talk sort of briefly. There's a word missing from the slide about transnational project management and development is the word that should be there. Um, this is going to be interspersed. These um, these uh, moments of the talk excitedly we're excited about it with uh, voices from the project i.e students who have worked with us who sent in short clips about their experience working um working with this collaborative research group and so in, in particular moments we're going to toggle over to listening to these students um, talk about their experiences and the work that they've been doing okay so i want to start off by talking very broadly about how why we should be concerned with the Gulf as a historical, as a cohesive historical space. Was the Persian Gulf a cohesive historical space for whom? And if so, what did it consist of? And how were people describing it in different historical communities? And after I've talked about a few of these different perspectives on the Gulf, I'll get to why we should care and the stakes of that question, especially um, in, in the region, uh, in the contemporary moment. So, you know, one perspective, and this, this map is a little bit, uh, Faded, but one perspective on the Gulf as a historical space comes from people who have been migrating across its waterways, engaged in trade and engaged in settlement. These were local communities that British imperial officers usually referred to as pirates. So you may have heard about them in that um, in that perspective, but there are people who had been there for many, many generations and have been really living on either side of um, what we've come to know in English as the Persian Gulf. Um, this is one, you know, set of people for whom the Gulf is definitely a cohesive historical space. But there are other uh, entities that have been interested in this region historically um, who have rather different perspectives on its geography, right? So for the post-Ottoman Arabic speaking Middle East, the Persian Gulf is a space that's sort of on the Eastern end of the wider Middle East region. Right. Um, the Ottoman, this is an Ottoman military map from 1897. The Ottomans called um, the Persian Gulf the Gulf of Basra. And for them, it was kind of an extension of their interests in Iraq. And really, you know, from this perspective, the Gulf is sort of facing the Eastern Mediterranean, an extension of that wider, largely Arabic speaking space. From another perspective, the Persian Gulf is the southern end of a Persianate world that extends up into Central Asia, right? So this is an um, 1894 German atlas entry called Iran and Turan. Um, oh, I have both 1894 and 1897. I think it's the first one. And this is, you know, from this perspective, uh, we're looking, uh, we're, we're basically looking north and the Persian Gulf is the southernmost um, area of this largely uh, Persian speaking space. There's another perspective that I think is sort of most um, 
uh, prevalent right now, especially among English speaking scholars in North America and elsewhere. And that's the Persian Gulf as part of the Indian Ocean world, right? There's been a pronounced turn towards thinking about global geography in terms of oceans among, um, among global historians uh, internationally, but again, especially in English. And so these are trading bases of a particular family of merchants and agents to British imperial residents that were extracted, it's extracted from an article by a scholar named James Only, who has worked extensively on the British imperial presence in the Gulf. And so this, in this perspective, the Gulf is really facing towards India, which doesn't quite show up, or the, the edge of it shows up um, on the map. And this is both, you know, a frame of reference that brings the Gulf into the Indian Ocean world, but it's also one that's very conditioned by the history of the British Empire. Right, so the British Empire, um, the British, uh, you know, imperial residents, some of whom we'll be talking about today, uh, were very much creating strong connections between Bombay and the residencies that line the waters of the Gulf that you see in the in um, okay, who cares? What are the stakes of this discussion? Why do these regional narratives matter? What are the stakes of Gulf history more generally? Why should we be concerned with? which perspective we speak about Gulf history from. Well, once all of these imperial um, entities that I've been talking about went away um, in the 1970s, what we have presently is a fragmented space of multiple nation states, each of which have pretty well-developed national um, narratives of Gulf history that follow particular political aims, right? So these stories that I've been telling you that are sort of overlapping yet often competing about where the Gulf sits in a global geography are very related to post-colonial questions of national identity. In terms of material stuff, they're very related to questions of citizenship. And they're also very related to the benefits that his citizenship confers. So in you know, the, the space where David and I first met in Abu Dhabi, whether you're a citizen or not is pretty much everything. It you know, has to do with how much, how much material benefit you get from the government. It has to do with when and how you can go in and out of the country. It has to do with whether you're a migrant worker or whether you're the person sitting in the office that the migrant worker has built, right? So these questions of who gets to be a citizen in these um, contemporary nation states, which again are quite fragmented, are really you know, crucial and connected to this question of where we fit the Gulf geographically. So for these three entities on the bottom, on the left is the Qatar National Library, in the middle is the National Records and Archives Authority in Oman, and on the right is the National Library and Archives in the UAE. These are all um, these are all archival entities in the Arabic-speaking small states on the western side of the Persian Gulf. For these three entities, the Gulf is an Arabic-speaking, you know, Middle Eastern space connected to that history, even though that only describes a minority of the people who actually live there who do not hold citizenship, right? So these are this question of where we place the Gulf. Um, uh, in a global geography are actually quite political, quite present questions when you're sitting in that space today. And since this research collective came out of the two of us being in that space together, um, I think you know that kind of explains the historical questions that we're asking. One of the things that we've we've come to, ah, so the other thing I wanted to say about these national archives is that the, you know, obviously from the spectacular architecture, quite a bit of money has been put into creating national archives in, 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 in particular Gulf states. Now, what they've been involved in is mainly collecting um, uh, uh, records and corpora from other imperial archives and putting them together in their own collections, not so much in making accessible um, the archives of, for example, local communities like the ones that I placed on the first slide. And so it's been kind of a challenge for historians to even find those records. Um, and one of the things, you know, our, our, our goal is not so much about collecting and creating a digital archive, but it is about thinking about ways to link those disparate ideas about Gulf geography in a space where we can put them into the same frame and put them into conversation with each other, right? So we see the digital as a space and a suite of mixed methods that allow us to link archival objects with overlapping and competing visions of the Gulf. 
right? So on the left, um, we have a, an excerpt from the India office record, um, which is about Kuwait. In the middle, we have the Gazetteer of the Persian Gulf, Oman, and Central Arabia. These are two are productions of the British Empire. Um, on the, on the, in the second to the, to the right, we have a um, Ottoman uh, travel log about uh, the Gulf region, especially about Iraq. And on the far right, we have a, um, a Persian language travel log about the, the eastern coast of the Persian Gulf. Um, and so by bringing all of these different um, multilingual sources into the same frame, or we feel that the digital allows us to do this and, and kind of create a space where we can analyze them um, in compelling in a compelling manner. And that's what we're gonna try to show you and explain to you today. I'm gonna pass over to um, to David to talk more about Open Golf as a, as a research collective. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Giovanna, and to everybody at SESTA for the invitation to be here. It's really exciting to be here this week and really been enjoying my interactions with people so far. So this uh, on this slide, one of the things I'm trying to articulate uh, is a little bit of the value-centered quality to the research that we're doing, right? It's not just a project which is about history, um, but it's a project which is actually situated uh, between two different uh, global communities and two different global communities that are in different stages of development uh, with respect to digital humanities research. And so for us, um, we're trying uh, in, as much as we can, and as I think speaks to the, the public and the digital humanities public lecture, to have a really a wide range of stakeholders here. And that means for us, especially undergraduates, my own institution is a largely undergraduate institution. Um, and so involving students in research internships uh, and in possibilities for developing um, all kinds of skills and, and critical approaches to those skills is a really important part of what we're doing. Um, I also can't uh, underscore enough this idea of uh, the, that we've uh, embraced here of, of, a, of a minimal and sustainable infrastructure. I think that one of the things that's really important in the part of the world where I am based is that um, while, whereas my institution is actually quite resourced and quite well set up to do research, all of the other institutions that are surrounding me, many of which are uh, providing me with interns, are not uh, in that state. Uh, and so that idea, it's not just a question uh, from digital humanities itself of, kind of uh, an, an attachment to minimal computing as, a, as, a, as an approach, but it's in particular relationship um, to the, um, the, the part of the world in which I work. So wherever possible, we're approaching us. So for example, our website is a, just a very simple static um, sort of site. We're also using open source tools, et cetera. Um, we're trying to link data and make that also open. So if you go to our site, you'll find data sets, structured data sets for reuse um, and description um, that, you, that people can use uh, in pedagogy. And I think that's one of our, the horizons in the future is trying to imagine how can the outputs of Open Gulf be reused in the Middle Eastern studies or Manasseh, South Asian, or whatever version of history that it is that the Gulf sits, um, though that data can be used there. Um, we're also really adamant about the idea of uh, uh, acknowledging all stakeholders and having co-authorship. Um, so you'll see, you're gonna hear three students um, uh, sort of small testimonials uh, over the course of the project today, all of three of whom uh, have been co-authors of us on uh, research presentations and published papers. Um, Norris already talked about multilingual uh, questions and centering um, a big golf in, in global history, but I think especially um, coming also from MY over Dhabi, centering new voices uh, in that conversation is a really important one. We don't hear a lot of people from, the, from that region um, uh, joining the digital humanities community and talking about it. So um, what I'd like to do uh, now is to move on to uh, the first section of our paper, which is about text creation. So um, as Nora mentioned, we have a kind of a, a, a variegated landscape of, 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 of sources. We don't really have lots of sources from all different kinds of languages. One of the languages we definitely have sources in is English. And so the QDL, the Culture Digital Library is, is very important for us and very important for our work. Um, and the QNL, the Country National Library, has really embarked in the last, um, I guess, 10 years or so, maybe probably more, there's been the planning stages, on a process of building a digital library, as Nora mentioned, amassing sources from other uh, imperial archives in a digital collection, which could then be brought together. Now, we, of course, don't want to, the, the first of this has been a partnership with the British Library um, and in the digitization of the India office records. So 
we of course don't want to wait for the Persian version and for the, the the Indian archives and for the French archives and the Turkish archives and all those things. So we're just sort of forging ahead with our uh, particular um, with our particular agenda. Um, but uh, we we should see from them. That's what they've claimed. Uh, 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 other um, phases, right, of the building out of that archive. So one of the great things about that archive is well designed for digital humanities work. It's IIIF compliant. They're very clear reuse licenses. Um, they've done batch OCR transcriptions of everything which is typewritten in the archive. So they've really a, an amazing searchability and amazing reuse quality to that. One of the disadvantages, of course, is all the handwritten stuff, which is not um, uh, indexed. It's well described in terms of metadata, but is not searchable. Um, and so that's actually what I'm going to talk about right now is actually how we've worked with HTR or handwritten text recognition to, to open up that archive. And But the thing that I want to say is that in this kind of speaks to some debates that are going on in multilingual digital humanities right now, we tend to um, sort of fetishize language as an expression of a singular people, right? And what's really interesting about this particular archive is that it's a lot of English, including a lot of translations from Arabic and Persian, many of which are not still around anymore because they were ripped out or gotten rid of or whatever. But there's a lot of people talking through English. And so it's kind of an early example of a globalized English corpus, which I believe gives us access to a lot of different voices than just the colonial. And I think that's what I'm going to try to say, uh, try to argue today. So this text creation project, we, because I wanted to do a kind of a pilot of this instead of, uh, we had to train the models. Is, so, at, you know, working from this whole collection, which is 280 volumes, I think somewhere around 20 million words, I'm not 100% sure of that, but they were essentially letters of ingoing and outgoing correspondence, incoming and out going correspondence that were copied into these ledger volumes. So we've been working with those. To our, our knowledge, this is the largest collection of anything written in the Gulf uh, that we have in digitized format. So it's kind of a perfect place for us to start on this project. Um, and as I, as I mentioned just a, a second ago, it's really important in the sense that it's a multi-source and kind of multi-voice uh, collection. There's a lot of different people contributing in here. So we're using digital methods at this point for a kind of exploratory data analysis um, uh, purpose. So I'm going to pass to Nora, who's going to speak a little bit about text creation from not on English, but from multilingual sources. So um, I just want to make the general point that, you know, one of the reasons we've started with um, some of the English materials that are made available by the Qatar Digital Library is because they are available in digital form, right? And one of the big challenges that we've faced is finding materials, especially in languages other than English, that we can actually do digital analysis on because these materials are not available in machine readable form, right? We can't do any kind of, you know, they need to be in a text file for, for the people for whom this is, this, is, um, this is a new idea. So we have started to do some text creation on non-English sources using records that we've taken both from the Qatar Digital Library. So as David was saying, this is actually a very multilingual collection, British Imperial collection, as British Imperial collections were all over the world. Um, and then we also have a collection of early 20th century merchant letters from a private library in Dubai called the Juman Majid Center of Culture and Heritage. Um, and these are handwritten letters um, between merchants, similar to that map I showed earlier all over the Indian Ocean world about the commodities, the prices, et cetera, that they are, that they are dealing with. And so what this entails is using um, Transcribus, which David is also using, the program David is also using for the English sources to create uh, machine learning models to you know, move from images of Arabic script into uh, machine readable Arabic text. Um, the, uh, we, we're going to uh, involve a student in a minute who's going to talk more about how that is gone. But one of the things that we've started thinking about, I mean, this process has been, been challenging, I would say, partly because we don't have a corpus of 20 million words in handwritten Arabic the way that David has in English. That just doesn't exist either in the Qatar Digital Library Archive or anywhere else in you know, sources of Gulf history that we are aware of. Um, it does elsewhere, of course, in um, sources on, on Middle East history, but for the Gulf, we haven't 
you know, to, to date, we haven't found that corpus where we could train a model on a small part of that and then use it to transcribe a much wider, um, a much wider number or much larger number of words and then do, um, do various analysis. So one of the other ideas that actually our student has put forth, who's going to speak in a minute, Hamid Khalil, is um, publishing annotated versions of those, um, of those letters. This is a letter collection between the uh, rulers of Kuwait and the British uh, representative in, in um, uh, so that people would be able to, uh, you know, see uh, places, people um, mentioned within those, and do, you know, very sort of uh, limited analysis on that kind of on that kind of tax document. So that's one of the kind of futures we, we're we're currently discussing for this project. Um, we're going to move to Mo and David. Just see if I can do this. Student videos. Let me just click here. Yep. You have to double click on that. Hi, um, my name is Mo Khalil. Um, I'm a senior from Lebanon. I'm currently studying computer science. And I first joined Open Golf as a sophomore. Um, so it was January of 2021 when I first joined. And so I've been there for around um, almost two years now. And when I first joined, um, David and Nora were working on an OCR model, um, which is an optical character recognition model for typed Arabic text. And what that is, is it's a machine learning model where you put as input um, a picture of typed Arabic text and then get as output um, the actual text, like in a text file format. And although this was a very interesting project and a very interesting proof of concept at the time, I think there were already some limitations to the project. Um, for one, it had already kind of been done. Uh, Google Translate had um, an option. You know, if you just open Google Translate, you can just open your camera, take a picture of any typed Arabic text or like any other language, really. A lot of languages are supported and it'll transcribe it for you. But, you know, I think more importantly than that, um, the goal of Open Golf has always kind of been to, um, you know, use technology to uncover voices that historically have not been uncovered in the Arab Gulf. Um, and I think by limiting ourselves to typed text, that would kind of go against what we were aiming for because... If you look at most of the people that were like publishing type text in the time periods that we look at, which is, you know, 19th century, early 1800s to late 1800s and a bit of the early 1900s, a lot of that text in the Arab Gulf um, was written by the same people that have already written the narrative on the Arab Gulf. And so there wasn't really much, you know, it wasn't really very productive to just look at that again. And so because of that, the project pivoted um, a few months into me being at Open Gulf to building a handwritten text recognition model, um, which would do the exact same thing. It would transcribe text in Arabic, but this would be doing it on handwritten text. And this was a huge improvement for one, because of all the reasons that I said before, you know, um, allowed us to look at like a way broader variety of texts, um, but also because unlike a lot of, um, you know, a lot, a lot of like Western history and a lot of like even Arab history in the Levant and like the North in, in North Africa, um, the history of like the Arab Gulf and the historical texts of the Arab Gulf have not been centralized. And there isn't really this like hub where you can just go in and get that history and get all these documents that have been published. A lot of them are just handwritten letters that are, you know, available either on like Twitter pages, like Twitter historians that will publish letters from the 19th century that they got from like their great grandfather, or it'll be like, you know, digital libraries or just random forums from like the early 2000s where interested historians would just publish these like little like, maybe diaries that they found from like the 19th century in the Gulf or like letters and all of these were handwritten. And so we realized that like writing this handwritten text for the Gulf more than like anywhere else, even within the Arab world, that would allow us to look at a way broader variety of texts and like a way broader variety of voices. And so we've been working on that since then. Um, we've been, been able to get the air rate on that all the way down to 18%, um, which granted is not like perfect transcription, but getting one in five characters wrong um, in handwritten Arabic transcription, which is already really hard language to transcribe, that's like a really, really good result. And through that, we've been able to do a lot of different things. Um, we've been able to, um, you know, publish papers, present at the Digital Humanities Summer Institute in 2021, um, present to um, Stanford faculty, non-Stanford faculty. And I think going forward, um, our goal is to continue on that hopefully improve, you know, the model and be able to 
eventually do it on such like a large mass um, scale that for one, we could become one of the hubs that don't already exist for, you know, historic texts on the Gulf. But I think also um, we just want to be able to use that data once we have enough of it. And once we have a reliable system to, you know, uncover more about the Arab Gulf, whether it's like place name um, highlighting, whether it's like creating maps, creating models. And so I think it's really exciting where the future of open Gulf is going. Um, so I want to, we're going to shift a little bit and talk about this question of what you do once you have machine readable text. So what kind of analyses, um, would, you know, do we want to, do we want to perform on this machine readable text once we have it? And again, we have a lot of it in English. We have not so much of it in other languages. And that just speaks to the, the global state of, of the technologies for creating this kind of text. So Open Gulf really, when we first started in 2018 at NYU Abu Dhabi, um, we were we decided to work on this uh, really iconic text for historians of the Gulf, John G. Lorimer's Gazetteer of the Persian Gulf, Oman, and Central Arabia. This is iconic in the sense that this is the kind of text that historians of the Gulf have on their shelf, and they pull it off when they need to look up a particular community or a particular place. It has little descriptions. But we wanted to analyze it as a, um, you know, as a as a relic of imperial knowledge production, right? As an object of imperial knowledge production, and what we what we did was recruit students over a period of two years to annotate using a platform called Recogito to annotate um, place names in the text, all of the place names in the text. It's it's about a 5,000 page um, uh, gazetteer. And, and we, we worked on about half of that, which is this geographical dictionary. Um, it was very easy for us to OCR that text because it's in English. So it was easy to create a text file. That first step that's taking us so long with these texts in other languages. But um, once, we, once we did that with a lot of student assistance and student labor over the next two years, we were able to create a data set about, of about 50,000 locations about 20,000 of them are unique. And what you see on the right is a preliminary map of verified locations that are mentioned in Lorimer's Gazetteer. And you know, this is kind of presenting to you in very preliminary, not cleaned up, not complete form, where the British um, concentrations of interest were across this region and also kind of the boundaries of, of their spatial interest in this region in 1908, 1909. But um, you know, this data set is far from finished, um, especially places that are not as well known. We've had to spend a long time trying to verify. And a number of Stanford students are now involved in the process of disambiguating it, cleaning it up, getting it to a point where it could be publishable, um, and also where we'll be able to link it up with data sets um, that we create using other kinds of texts, right? So one of our kind of visions for this project is to create a multi-source Gulf gazetteer where we'd be able to, you know, for example, a user might be able to click on a location and see where it's mentioned and in what terms it's mentioned in multiple texts in multiple languages, right? So one of the, the you know, this is a text that we've worked on, or it's a map of text mentioned, um, places mentioned in an Arabic text that we've worked on from 1869. This is a um, Ottoman, Era Arabic speaking and Arabic writing scholar, um, met, you know, describing um, the Arabian Peninsula and Iraq in very uh, detailed geographic terms. And we think, you know, once we're able to sort of put the the uh, data generated from this text in comparison with what we get from the gazetteer, it's a way that we can kind of contextualize and destabilize the dominant British narratives that we get from um, that, that uh, Lorimer project. The British, you know, British uh, knowledge production about the geography of the Gulf is with us and will be with us for a very long time. It's quite hegemonic and quite dominant. It's also the most voluminous that we've found in terms of historical sources. But by bringing these other texts into conversation, we're able to see um, in many instances and in many particular um, locations. The other thing, you know, it, so if, if textual annotation is kind of one way that we can bring different texts into conversation, another way that we can do that is actually through analyzing historical maps. And so um, this is a, um, uh, uh, an Ottoman military map that was created uh, right around 1909, 1910, so right around the same time as Lorimer's Gazetteer. And it's, it's 
depicting or attempting to depict uh, the grazing grounds of the tribes, communities that the Ottomans called tribes, in the three provinces of Mosul, Baghdad, and Basra, which make up contemporary Iraq. And it also has a little inset on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and it has, it's, it's very difficult to see because it's, it's a very faded map. But what we were able, it has sort of boundaries of each um, community's grazing grounds. And what we were able to do is geo-reference that. So we were able to take this spatial representation and put it onto a contemporary um, uh, geographic reference, i.e. a contemporary base map, um, in order to, you know, perform some analyses about what the Ottomans were saying about the communities inhabiting those spaces. And so up on the upper right, it's a little bit difficult because of the screens, but you can see um, the sort of concentrated area in the upper right is Iraq, and then the wide areas of the Arabian Peninsula. Underneath the, the map, you can see a little bit on the bottom, is a very detailed, extensive table um, chronicling each community's weapons holdings, population, um, uh, all sorts of different things, what kinds of housing they were living in. Um, and we were able to put that side by side with data that we extracted from Lorimer. So on the left is data extracted from the um, Ottoman map and table about uh, weapons holdings. And on the right is uh, British data uh, extracted about the, the region just um, over the Iraqi border, and it's now called Khuzestan, also about weapons holdings. And what's compelling about this is these are not directly comparable sources, right? These imperial forces were not counting the same things. Um, they were not, you know, creating the exact same representations, but were able to show places in which they overlapped places in which their interest overlapped and places in which they might have looked at the same place and seen something completely different. And so this is, you know, kind of the way that I think this, this or we think that this digital space allows us sort of a new horizon um, in methods of comparative imperial analysis, right? Um, it allows us to bring these texts into conversation in a way that it's very difficult to do when we're just reading them and sort of comparing them semantically. Um, we're going to have one more, another student contribute. Oh, wait, I need to go back here. Hi, my name is Nada Amagi, uh, and I graduated from NYU Abu Dhabi in 2020 with a bachelor's degree in Arab Crossroads Studies and a minor in art history. I'm currently in my second year uh, in the MA in Arab Studies program at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. So shortly after finishing uh, my BA in 2020, I worked with professors Nora Barakat and David Grizzly, as well as the Open Wolf team, uh, on annotating toponyms and proper nouns in Lormer's Gazetteer of the Arabian Peninsula using a tool called Recogito. And I also worked on correcting OCR text from a French Gazetteer, uh, also on the Gulf, using another tool called From the Page. And at the time, I was new to both of these tools. So while working on these projects, um, I also had the opportunity to write a short blog pulling together some of the research that I'd done and trying to trace a historical route um, that some of these gazetteer writers might have taken. Um, I also very fortunately got to present with the team at several virtual conferences, which as a recent graduate is a tremendous uh, opportunity to be exposed to research in the field um, and to get to communicate some of the work that I was doing. So in many ways, my time with Open Gulf, which continues to today, has been really transformative for both my academic trajectory as well as my personal learning goals. And the first way that it did that was uh, that it showed me what collaboration in humanities and historical research could look like, especially since up until the time, most of my research was pretty independent. It also exposed me to what quantitative methodologies and tools in this field, whether historical research or humanities research more broadly could look like. Uh, because again, not only was my research really independent up until that point, but it also tended to lean more qualitatively. Um, so this quantitative approach and data use and kind of mode of inquiry within um, humanities research pushed me to think more about what these tools could look like in my own um, research. So using textual analysis, geospatial annotation, and different mapping tools, I wanted to see how we could learn more about the historical growth of art scenes in the UAE and exhibitions and how their spatial expansion um, can tell us more about uh, the interest in art in the region. So that's what I uh, did as a research fellow at NYU Abu Dhabi, and I used the tools that I learned at Open Gulf to dive more deeply into these questions. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it back to David to talk about word and setting. 
So what I'm going to do in this third part is to talk about ways that we, another way of using uh, HTR or handwritten text uh, recognition created text, right? So, and this is coming from the example of the Kato Digital Library. So in, the, in this previous section, we talked about largely uh, human work with annotation and georeferencing. This section is gonna be much more computational um, in the sense that we're actually gonna be working with um, packages in R for word vectors. So um, what I wanted to do is, because I was starting to work on word vectors after attending an NEH uh, advanced uh, topics in digital humanities seminar um, that the Women's Writers Project uh, from Northeastern University read, uh, led. And so what I did was I went to the Cutter Digital Library and I found a set of materials that happened to correspond to a moment in the residency when they started creating thematic books of letters. So instead of just a chronological order, they actually started putting uh, you know, letters about piracy into a particular volume, and letters about slave trade into a particular volume, and letters. That, so I took these, I chose 10 volumes um, early on, and the student that you're going to hear from next was uh, the person who brought that all together uh, for me. And then I later added five more. So with that all together, so 10, 15 volumes or so, I ended up with a corpus of about a million words. Now, just remember, this is corpus of a million words coming from and uh, a supervised machine learning process, which is imperfect in the sense that it doesn't, across different hands, it does not produce the same accuracy. So we're dealing, we're putting into a system of analysis text which has a lot of error, right? But the, okay, so the, the wager of this is that the we're looking for large scale patterns which will show up nonetheless because what we're doing is we're using a technology that looks at context. And so we're gonna see, you're gonna see in some of the examples that come out that it's not gonna be very clear what some of the words are. And even for me, it's a little bit hard to figure it out. So it's almost like messy text um, fed into then what are unsupervised um, uh, text machine learning uh, methods like word embeddings. So um, three questions I would ask to the historians in the room here that this work I think brings up is, First of all, how do our practices as scholars change when you have a collections as data approach? The term that's been used in the digital humanities community to mean when you have a collection which can be, uh, uh, which is digitized or digitizable, and so therefore you imagine creating that collection for computational use. Second question is what kinds of skills does tomorrow's historian or even today's historian need to have to work effectively with this mass of information? And then third, and I'm not 100% sure that I have the answer to this question today, is how is bias uh, amplified using the two kinds of machine learning that we're using? So first, the supervised, and then second, the unsupervised. So a little word about word, uh, just a word about word embeddings. Uh, Julia Flanders has this definition of word embeddings. A word embedding model of a corpus is a representation of a corpus of text in a way that makes the semantic relationships between words easier for us to see and to work with. Very simple definition, very elegant definition. And then finally from Nicole Coleman, who was actually at Stanford University Libraries from a blog, um, digital images, which actually I think captures more the process of what we're actually doing of taking handwritten text recognition text and then analyzing it using um, digital methods. Digital images converted back to their numerical form makes them analyzable and computational in new ways that word embeddings, mathematical representations of words in vector space, would amplify the potential of natural language processing and dramatically change how we interact computationally with human language. Every book, pamphlet, manuscript, piano roll, and photograph held in the library can be computed against not merely based on the metadata, but based on patterns recognizable within the object and across collections of objects. So, if you think about the process, I chose things from the Cutter Digital Library based on metadata that was human created. She's kind of pointing to some other kind of descriptors or descriptions that we can come up with in text, which is almost like metadata or a notion or described description of text that comes imminently through the text based on the words that's actually used there. So just a word about, a, a second word about word embeddings, there's this notion, right, of the Geschichte, uh, right, this idea of a conceptual history that people like the Bielefeld School and Kozilek have thought about a lot. And this article by Weber and Kuhlen talk about how word embeddings, they can imagine word embeddings as kind of a digital conceptual history. In other words, you can 
hone in on concepts and look at lexical change over time, um, in addition to just sort of understanding generally what texts are talking about. We're not so much in this project at this point thinking about temporal change, because if you remember, I chose a period, a rather constrained period of time. But what's for really interesting for us, and I would say from a conceptual perspective, is that this allows us to tease out lexical strata of all these voices that are found inside of the corpus, right? So we get to hear from colonial agents and native agents and local rulers and these different letters, and we get to compare those at this level of abstract distant reading. And that's a really exciting thing to be able to do, I think, from uh, for, for the historian and the historian of the future. So um, if you think about this as a kind of like amazing a capacity to understand more words and more text than the human mind can really kind of take in. We can then kind of zoom down into a concept. So here are two notions that come from this corpus, one of piracy and one of the so-called Napoda, which I'll talk about in a second. So piracy is really important in this, uh, in this corpus from the 1850s. And what you get then here is a kind of computed word similarity to piracy. So what do we get? We'll get piracy pursuits, failures, aggression, instigation, terror, defense. Like, this is the language of the outgoing colonial records. So this is the way that the kind of the collective colonial voice, if you want to say it, is describing or is, 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 is intimating that piracy is somehow related to it in the sense that piracy is found in the same context as these other words. On the other hand, we have this interesting word, Nahoda, right, which is this Persian word uh, meaning the captain or the captain of a boat uh, is a really important figure in this corpus of these boats, these those that would go along the coast and move between all these different jurisdictions in the Gulf. And here, um, the interesting thing is that it's a, it's not as clear of a picture where it was going on. And I think that part of that is due to maybe some OCR error, because the words that are in this corpus that are not English words are spelled differently by different people. And they're also not, there's no dictionary against which to, 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 to rank the, the potential spellings of the words. So you get a lot more error uh, in things like proper names and foreign words. But here you have some stuff, you have names of people. You do have a little bit, some words that do, deal with violence. You have some other words that deal with uh, community and neighborhoods. So there's something here, a kind of a mixed signal that you might get around what that word might actually be uh, might be suggesting. So you can do something with word embeddings called, which is kind of like an arithmetic. So if you imagine, imagine vector space as this kind of complex mathematical representation of words, of the words of key words that are used in similar contexts. So what you can do is you can kind of like filter out whole sections of that. So if we take the word Nahoda, for example, and we take away the concept of a boat, here Bogla means a boat or a vessel, we end up with words like respectable, shakes, noble, recommended, influential. So it's like the boat minus the boatness kind of refers to then this community of people who are important for getting goods around the, around the Indian Ocean. If you take, on the other hand, you take the concept of the boat and you take away filiality or like familiness, because a lot of family language inside of it or neighborhoods. And here I just use the word sun as a proxy for that. You end up with things like African pearl goods attacked and plundered, that there's a part of this boatness, which is about the boat's situation on the Gulf with the problems that are in there in namely in a, in, a, in a situation of piracy. On the other hand, if we take the boat and we take away the violence and the boatness, right, what we end up in the vector space is Ali Abbas, Zeki, Mehdi, Amir, Mahmoud, and Jafar, which are all names of men, right? So we end up accessing here is like actually who the people were that were probably not necessarily the boat drivers, but the men who were somehow involved uh, in that particular uh, in that particular industry. It's really interesting ways of kind of slicing up what is an amazing amount of words and then trying to get at what are the different lexical or semantic, let's say semantic relationships that are associated with words. Now, one of the things that I realized that I had done when I originally, I, I don't, if you remember that I said that I had, uh, I created um, five more uh, volumes is I actually had um, 
I realized that I only, I, for the first corpus, I only had words uh, of the colonial outgoing letters. So what I did was I added in the ingoing letters and then I took a word like business. And I said, so on the left-hand side is the colonial agents and on the right-hand side are the native agents. And so then this idea of business and what's really interesting is the contrast between that. Like what does business mean for some of the voices inside of this large corpus and what does business mean uh, for others? And I'll let you uh, take a look at that and talk about that. In our discussion. Same thing with property, very similar, like property seems to me something that's very connected to uh, industry on the Gulf, vessels, crime, property, terror, Bugala's and Ingo boat, vessels, slaves, captures, etc. for the colonial agents, whereas for the native agents, it seems to be somehow more connected to family a little bit, to objects. So it, it's not always clear. And the one thing I have to say about the, in, <coughs> the incoming correspondence is because it's a small corpus, it's harder to do this kind of analysis on it, right? It really works when you're up in uh, the many thousands, hundreds of thousands of words. So just a quick note of that. One of the things that I think this provides, this method creating a corpus and then uh, is it, and is it, it provides us a, 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 a blueprint for using other sources. And so with my students at MWO Abu Dhabi and a class that I'm doing right now, we're working with another text, uh, completely other text, which is available in PDFs online. It's called the so-called Zanzibar Gazette. So Zanzibar is an island off of East Africa, really important for uh, trade, for slave trade, for all kinds of things, a, a juncture, if you like, between uh, Africa and the Gulf. And here, of course, as I was able to scrape, I got 7.5 million words, many, many, many more words. But what's interesting here is that that gave us, a, I, just, I know this is too small for the screen, it gave us a really, really specific like clusters in the corpus down to things like local names, British foods that were like in advertisements in this, uh, right? Uh, things like medicines, household objects, stomach problems, Spanish words, German words. It's like, in other words, it really reads the contents of that uh, very, very well and kind of helps us see these interesting semantic clusters. So I'm going to, uh, we're going to end this section just listening to Rhythm, who's going to tell us a little bit. Rhythm helped me in putting together the corpus uh, for, uh, that I was just talking about that I use with word vectors. Hello, everyone. My name is Rhythm Ukreja. I'm a student at NYU Abu Dhabi studying economics with specialization in finance and interactive media. I had the opportunity to work with the Department of Digital Humanities as a research assistant with Professor David Risley on a project that focuses on uh, his Gulf region's historical topography, as well as pre oil handwritten archive materials. I generated data for both geographical analysis and AI powered handwritten recognition, and also automated transcription. This project was called the Handwritten Gulf Archives. The Hampton Gulf Archives project concentrates on creating Hampton archives about the Gulf region accessible to wider historical inquiry. I began my work on this project by transcribing digitized version of 19th century India office record letter books. And after running the layout analysis, we built ground truths for the training of deep learning based on HDR, Hampton text recognition systems, such as transcribers. During this process, I also had the opportunity to learn the natural language toolkit, NLTK. The purpose of this was to generate an archival collection searchable and usable for different research studies around the world, such as in the historical text as data project. Thank you. Great. So I hope the voices were kind of helpful in, in, in getting you, uh, giving, you a, giving you a feeling of what they were actually doing, um, the way that the students are even are able to articulate what that means uh, as a as a as a young researcher, but also as a as Nada mentioned, sort of for the, what their own learning goals were, what they were able, the way they were able to take those um, those goals and, and and move out. So the very last uh, part of our talk, which is just a little code, it'll take us just a couple minutes, is about project management and development. When you have two institutions which are separated by twelve hours of time zones, um, and uh, so. Uh, you know, there's just the names of people who have been working with us over the number of years are just enormous, right? We don't all come to the same space. And increasingly, especially with the pandemic, it's almost like we're never going to be in the same space. Um, and so I think that, that what we wanted to do is just leave you with a little bit of an idea about some of what the challenges are when you're working in such a group, which is a research group distributed across the globe. We can just go stay here, maybe. Yeah. We're really, we're going to finish up in two minutes because we want to have time for questions. 
But, um, you know, this had been an issue even when we were, uh, these project management issues had been there, even when we were still in the same institution, because we had students, uh, we were working with researchers and in other institutions, you know, um, uh, people who were faculty and staff in other institutions, and also students were graduating and going on, like Netta, who you saw, to, you know, their, their greater horizon, but staying involved with the project. But this institutional schedule and rhythm problem really became quite acute when I um, left NYU Abu Dhabi and came to Stanford. So, you know, one of the big issues is that Stanford is on a quarter system, NYU Abu Dhabi is on a two semester system, so we're never kind of on the same schedule. <laughs> Students are, um, you know, having stress attacks over things like midterms, and we're having stress attacks over things like grading and deadlines on, on entirely different uh, frames. And so bringing that together has been challenging. It also presents the opportunity of having people engaged in different ways sort of all the time. But the challenge that presents is that you have to have someone to manage that all the time. And so that's been, you know, one of our, again, both challenges and opportunities. We're also, um, we're dealing with very different, we realized once I got here, funding, hiring, and infrastructure, administrative infrastructure situations between NYU Abu Dhabi, which is part of this, you know, very complex global network and between Stanford, which is a gigantic complex institution in itself. So figuring out how to do that, you know, in an imp implemented, integrated way, as David said in the beginning, in a way that really centers the project's existence in Abu Dhabi is also one of the things that we're, we're facing. Um, we also spend, and maybe we'll talk about this more for a minute in project development, in the project development section, but, you know, we're really committed to structuring new opportunities for students. That's been something that we've been, you know, really focused on from the beginning. Um, and we're now dealing with students who are in very different contexts. And so figuring out how to do that sort of across this space, but also to give them a sense of being part of a global community of researchers. So getting them on Zoom together, getting them to understand the specificity of their own institutional situation, um, and also their own sort of uh, thinking and background vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf is another um, positionality. Yes, thank you, that's the word I want. Vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf is another, is another part of it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of skip over training materials and just say one of the ways that we've dealt with this is by having a, um, a you know, a, a workspace, a messaging platform called Mattermost that we work in. We work in the Google workspace quite a bit as well, just because simply because it's the easiest thing for everybody interinstitutionally to have access to. So it doesn't, there's not a lot of sort of barriers when we first bring people on board and from the previous slide, we're kind of doing that continuously. And then the other point is just that we're trying to kind of take our time you know, we're not in a situation where we feel like we have big deadlines and that kind of gives us the space to um, let the let projects go in different directions based on who's coming in with what skills, right? So there's an open-ended aspect of it that can sometimes be frustrating, but it also kind of gives us the space to have those students actually, um, you know, direct, the direct, direct where we're going in terms of research outputs. And I'll let David conclude with a couple of ideas about project management. And then we'll right. So I think I wanted to have something more than just project management. So we always talk about PM, but we don't really talk about how a project grows or how a researcher grows over time. We kind of, and I think that one of the important things when you have such a varied community, and you also have students coming through quickly and leaving sometimes quite quickly, is kind of understanding. Um, how how a project can develop or how the pieces of a research group can develop uh, given that context. So first of all, uh, very important to know that the project has really different meanings in the two places. <laughs> I tried to allude to this in the value statement at the beginning, but DH at Stanford and DH in the Middle East or DH at NYOW is like, they're very different things. They're very different animals. They're completely different states of development. And it's, I think, really important for us in this project, or in, this, in this research group, is to give it, give space for the, the two institutions to kind of make it their own, right? Uh, to, to find something inside of it. And maybe that space is then actually really what a space of collaboration between institutions might look like, as opposed to just having an MOU and, 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 and talks or, you know, maybe a mobility of researchers or something like that. And I say here in the next point, we used to call Open Belt a project. I call it that all the time. Um, but it's really a, a set of interconnected projects. Um, it's really a group of people working together, a virtual research group. It's kind of a virtual lab, if you like. And I think we want to think a little bit more about what that's going to mean 
um, uh, moving forward um, as virtuality changes, right? And it seems like it's kind of changing a lot underneath our feet. Um, agile minimal infrastructure is really important, uh, although we're increasing in complexity. Um, the second, this last, I just kind of, I'm going to end with this particular, these two, these two last points, but the, the, we have different strengths in the different institutions and those strengths kind of speak to, um, infrastructure, uh, they speak to, uh, language skills. And so infrastructure as a human thing, but also infrastructure as a physical material thing. And we, it's actually quite complicated, but I, what we're trying to do is to allow both institutions to shine at the same time and kind of allow it the space of, 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 of the research group to uh, be beneficial to both institutions. Um, that being said, one of the challenges is that there's a different narrative. There are different narratives which emerge from Open Gulf. And so whereas area studies, for example, in public history are really important at Stanford, um, I think in the Abu Dhabi context, knowledge development and thinking about uh, the, uh, the digital humanities and the skills that are associated with that on the context of local history is actually more important in some ways, right? And these are two really different things. And so how do you keep that in balance? That's one of our, our main challenges. So um, I'm going to stop there and thank everyone for attending today, both here and online. And we look forward to this.